instead find history. In the West, few know about Zhang He, but in China, he is thought of as an explorer of great repute. A recent find in East Africa now suggests that the Chinese may have beaten the Europeans to the punch in establishing trade relations, possibly by several decades more than once thought. Here to talk about a 600-year-old coin and its significance is Shapukra Kusimba, curator of African anthropology at the Field Museum. Welcome, Dr. Kusimba. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Where and how was this coin discovered? We found this coin on the island of Manda in Trench One, in Level One. The island of Manda is off the Kenyan coast in the Lamu Archipelago. This is a region where a few years ago, in the I think it was in the early 90s, a British archaeological group re- uh, discovered the earliest mosque in sub-Saharan Africa that was dated to around 750 AD. So it's a, a region that we know also sees uh, the earliest rise of urbanism, earliest manifest- manifestations of urbanism in sub-Saharan Africa. Of course, Ethiopia beat East Africa to, to it, but uh, the Kenyan coast, or the Swahili coast as we call it, has been a region that has uh, interacted with the Mediterranean world, Western Asia, and South Asia it, during, for the last 2,000 years, you might say. So um, the finding of this coin on this particular island at the site that was burned to the ground around 1430 AD, just a few years after Admiral Cheng Ha made his famous uh, expedition to explore the Western Indian Ocean. I think that what surprised us was essentially the, the timing that the, the site was abandoned, as far as we know, in 1430 AD. It was never re-inhabited again. And on day one of carrying out our excavations in Trench One, we actually found uh, this coin. In terms of the coin itself, you said that this city had been a port of a lot of different types of international trade. How do we know that the coin came from Zheng Ha versus someone Zheng Ha may have traded with elsewhere who brought it in? Uh, we don't. Uh, we don't know, and um, it is quite possible that uh, you know, there were two things that are going on when you look at uh, coins, particularly doing business in the ancient world. Uh, when you think about it, would have been very cumbersome because you have needed to carry a lot of money uh, in coinage. They didn't have notes at the time. In fact, Muslims later invented the check. Uh, the, the original word for for the check is an Arabic word called sak, huh. and and so essentially s a k k, and so in in many many respects a lot of the coins uh, that would have uh, been carried around uh, would have been uh, would have served many purposes and I think for imperial issues such as the the coin that we are looking at they essentially playing a dominant role as tokens. These will essentially be diplomatic gifts that will be given, uh, issued from the emperor to his or her counterpart. In most cases, it was often his counterpart. Uh, they are like these commemoration coins that are often given. Uh, Obama was giving up uh, out some to his uh, contributors and things like that. So it serves that kind of diplomatic uh, purpose. But then the, the original purpose of coins, as we know, is the, it's money. And so with money, I think uh, once an issue is made, obviously you have to guard against counterfeits that will emerge. Right? Mm-hmm. And so when you find an, uh, a coin that is so rare like this, one of the things that you always think about as an archaeologist, is it an original issue or is it a counterfeit? And you can only know that when you do laboratory analysis, chemical analysis, that will then put together and help you identify the chemical composition of these coins. 
we know the chemical composition of the imperial issues has already been conducted. And I think that once we, we do ours, we'll be able to measure the inclusion we are finding from ours to what is already known. Only then will we be, will we be able to, uh, to know that this is an original imperial issue or this is, in fact, a counterfeit. Both are important because even if it is a counterfeit, the only place it could have come is Southeast Asia. Right? And Southeast Asia is not very close to East Africa. So it will just show that there is still that trade that is going on between East Africa and, and Southeast Asia. And, and because Southeast Asia is, is trading directly with, with China, I think that the impact will, from a stand, scientific standpoint, will still be the, the same. But it remains to be told that this is the second Chinese coin to be found in the shores of East Africa that is quite clearly a Chinese coin, and one cannot argue with, with that. You said several interesting things. One that I think we forget, and it's true even to today to a degree, is that the value of a coin is symbolic. It's an agreed yeah. value between multiple cultures, multiple peoples. Now, yeah. I imagine back in 1400 A.D., that value is even more nebulous because if you're taking your coin to some place that you've never traded with before, there's very little trade going on. How yeah. do they justify what that price is? So it is interesting that that was more of a diplomatic tool and maybe that's what its true significance was to begin the opening of discussion. I think that you're quite right there and I think that it's everybody – uh, who knows anything about the Asian world. Uh, the time period that we are really talking about is when the power in the Asian world is really coming to an end. Uh, Asians had been controlling commerce politics uh, in the region from around 700 to 1500 AD, and that's when you begin to see the Europeans sort of enter the Indian Ocean and the tide begin to really shift. But... Before that, uh, I think that silk was really the, the standard. If you look at most of the exchanges that are going on, everybody recognized that silk was, it was used as currency all the way from China to East Africa to the Mediterranean world. Uh, and I think in East Africa, for example, ivory too was in fact served as a, as a currency. But there were uh, means in all of the regions. In East Africa, they, we had our own means. Uh, but in many cases, I think the universal currency at the time, right now, it's the mighty dollar, right? Everybody recognizes that. But I think that during the time that we are talking about, we did not have what you might call a regional value currency. But I think that there were things that were recognized that would be exchanged. And I think that I would place silk to be one of the dominant value uh, systems that had been put in, in place. So there are a lot of these coins are regional in scope. They are accepted, but I think that none is uh, being, it will be accepted in all of the, the regions. What we do know is that in Western Asia, in Western the Western Indian Ocean, Muslim merchants were dominant, and then uh, up to all the way to Central Asia, and then from what you might call Eastern Asia, from Sri Lanka going to the South China Seas, uh, you'll see that Buddhist merchants were, in this case, quite dominant. Both the empires, whether it is Buddhist-led or Muslim-led were very trader-friendly, and I think that that's why commerce was able to prosper during that time. There was some degrees of regulation, which we talk today, but I think that uh, that regulation, in most cases, I think the markets regulated themselves. There's a lot of competition. There's a lot of uh, partnerships that are being built across the board, uh, and most of, and, but, this, but, but, but most of all, there's a lot of respect and protection for traders. So a trader could set off from, let's say, a Cairo in Egypt and go all the way to Malacca and be able to conduct business without ever being 
molested. It was essentially a borderless world in, in many, many respects. Scholars are moving across this region. You know, religious leaders are going around. You have sultans and kings uh, developing what you might call today think tanks, where they bring scholars from different religions and backgrounds to sit and debate the major issues of the day. And I think that this was, while this was going on, this is a time that we're also beginning to see the movement of precious goods that archaeologists are now beginning to recover. Well, the publics do not know that there is a much longer history linking Asia, Europe, and Africa that goes back, that is traceable to, as far as I know, the last 5,000 years. The Indian Ocean is the oldest maritime uh, sea in the world. When you think about what we eat today, rice that Americans consume is Asian rice. But this Asian rice came to the Americas not directly from Asia, by, by way of Africa. In Asia, a lot of people eat millet and sorghum. These are African domesticates that, in fact, become staple foods in Asia nearly 4,000 years ago. The bananas that we eat, uh, these are Southeast Asian domesticates that become established in Africa some 3,000 years ago. So you're really talking about a long deep time period when communities around the world have engaged in interactions. And one of the exciting things about how a lot of flowers and, in fact, food move around is that the issue of taste. Any time I read, for example, explorers or adventurers' writings or diaries about the food that will be eaten at the sultan's course, let's say even in Central Asia, a city like Bukhara, that same food will be, it was being served in East Africa, it was being served in North Africa, in Aleppo, in Syria, and even in Spain. But the, the issue of taste and the role that uh, the, the taste of these rich people, how it helped shape the world uh, that we know today, I think is often underestimated. But it just serves to show that a lot of the major discoveries as we know them, whether they are in science, in engineering, mathematics, uh, business, uh, the check, as I mentioned earlier, it's all uh, issues of banking and insurance that we know today as very, very Western uh, concepts. These are concepts that are being developed by merchants working uh, in collaboration with a lot of the political leaders in the various Asian cities and city-states. So nothing significant is known, I think, that from the scholars' perspective, from the public, I think uh, we know so little. And I think from a political standpoint, I think that because of China's increasing influence in the world, I think that the finding of this very early evidence makes it a lot more exciting. So if I was a Chinese diplomat listening in, I'd say this is a real opportunity for us to begin talking about this long-established relationship that goes back to even 70 years before Europeans set foot in, in Africa. So, <laughs> so it's that kind of thing. Looking at the bonds that bring us together, not to mention looking at how a penny is worth quite a bit of our thought. I'm Andrew yeah. Hiller for The Prism, and we've been speaking with Chapruka Kasimba, who is with the Field Museum. Thank you so much for your time and giving us an entree.